welcome to Made in Siberia, EMC. Electromagnetic compatibility is a black magic of modern day electronic design. And in this video I'm going to talk about tests and standards that compose EMC for various countries. In later videos I will tell you exactly how to pass the damn test. Let's begin. EMC practically comes down to is a declaration of conformity written on a piece of paper that states that your piece of electronic equipment is not going to cause damage or interference to another piece of electronic equipment. The declaration of conformity can be either self-certified, which may look something like this, or it can be certified by a third party or a test center such as Intertech, which may look something like this. What you get in case of third-party certification is that the test center takes all responsibility off your hands for proving the compliance to a regulating bodies if there is ever an inquiry. Fortunately, there is never an inquiry, and in actual fact the majority of devices on the market are self-certified, and very often they are self-certified blindly, which may as well say that they are non-compliant. Of course, I do not recommend to do that. What I would suggest is to do pre-compliance testing in a test center and then self-certify yourself so that you can save time and money and uh, essentially get the same result. But in order to do that, you must have a really good understanding of the tests and standards that come with EMC. So let's go straight into it. EMC basically is composed of conductive emissions, radiated emissions and electrostatic discharge. Now it has to be said that those are different to RF testing and safety testing, which I will cover in a separate video. And those uh, all together compose the basics of CE logo marking and UL listing. So let's begin with conductive emissions. The conductive emissions test is essentially the power supply test. In this test, the amount of interference coming back into the mains from your unit is measured. If you do not have power supply, for instance, if you power it via USB or wirelessly, then there is no conductive emissions test, job done. On the other hand, if you do have a power supply, then you have to do the test. And the testing procedure is specified in the European standard EN55432, which is analogous to a French standard CISPR22. In the United States, you've got FCC part 15, and in other countries you may have other standards, such as the Canadian ICS003, but all other standards typically follow the same curves as is with the two mentioned before. So you shouldn't really have to worry too much about it right now. Let's take a look at the typical test setup for conductive emissions. LISN stands for Line Impedance Stabilization Network and is represented by Roden Schwartz ENV216, which provides 50 ohm coupling impedance for measuring the EUT, which is tested in its normal operation mode. It practically means plugging in every input and output of the device and doing its normal function, which may be playing music or drying hair. The EMI receiver takes a snapshot of the emissions coming back into the mains and compares them against the limits. And at the end the result will look something like this. The blue line is the peak values and the black lines are the average values. The red MQP limit stands for maximum quasi-peak and the red MAV limit stands for maximum average. You can just about see the quasi-peaks as the red pulses on the graph. If you are confused, let's just say that the quasi-peak values and limits are the ones that matter the most and that they are the ones that take the longest to compute as well. Aside of normal operation mode, I highly recommend to test in what is known as pure resistive load, which practically means attaching a big bulky resistor to your power supply and measuring it instead of its normal operation. What it basically means is that you're simulating the worst case scenario for the power supply, and if it passes it, then you can be absolutely assured that it's going to pass in any other scenario as well. Moving on to radiated emissions testing, this test can be actually the hardest one to pass and it can be rather inconsistent as well. Bear in mind that you will get different results in semi-anechoic chambers and full anechoic chambers as well as with different temperature and different humidity. That's why you will often find those specified on a graph somewhere which we will examine in a minute. So let's take a look at the typical test setup. 
In addition to EMI receiver, a high bandwidth spectrum analyzer is also necessary, as well as a bunch of antennas and shielded cables. And as you can see, those things can be really expensive. Just as before the equipment is placed 0.8 meters above ground, but what's different now is that the table rotates 360 degrees around its axis. The antenna is positioned 3 meters away from the EUT and its height also varies between 1 and 4 meters above ground. Both horizontal polarization and vertical polarization of the antenna are set to take the measurement. And as you can imagine, this test can take a little while to compute, so it might be a good idea to go grab a cup of tea. And at the end of the test, the result will look something like this. Note that those are peak values. Since all peak values were below the limit, no quasi-peak measurements were necessary. However, if you fail by a small margin, it's a very good idea to zoom in and do a quasi-peak measurement on a peak, and it may bring it down just enough to pass the test, at least on this day. Also note that CIS PR22 lines are more strict than the FCC ones. So during pre-compliance testing you can safely ignore the FCC values and if the unit passes CIS PR you can assume that it will pass the FCC as well. Also in case you're wondering, here's how the test data looks like above the 1 GHz. Typically you do not have to worry too much about it unless your device has some powerful wireless features. Also for completeness, let's take a look at the measurement lines from the Canadian standard I mentioned, the ICS003. They look slightly different, but the limits are exactly the same as with FCC, so really I don't understand why Canadians have to stand out here. To summarize the radiated emissions, of course it's a great idea to keep them as low as possible, but of course it's a compromise, and as you will see later, the best EMC practices can be rather expensive. Therefore, many large companies build their own anechoic chambers and build their own test equipment, so they can test those things on a day-to-day -day basis and fine-tune them uh, to uh, it passes the test but just enough without uh, costing too much to the company. And this is a senior level skill here to know exactly where to compromise and where not to. Pretty much anything gets tested for radiated emissions these days, including this F-16 fighter jet. Finally, let's talk about ESD testing. ESD testing is a simulation of electrostatic discharge that's coming from the human to electrical unit. Now, as you have all probably experienced, human to human it doesn't cause much problem. But when applied from human to an electrical device, in particular to directly to an integrated circuit, it can cause a lot of damage. So let's imagine a typical setup. Our piece of equipment carefully minds its own business and sits on a table 0.8 meters above ground as before. And then zap, zap, and another zap. A person with a scary looking ESD gun comes along and starts zapping our piece of equipment in all the different places. And why is he doing that? Well, he is applying electrostatic discharge to all the different inputs and outputs on a device. And he's trying to check that the device stays in its operational mode and doesn't break or stop functioning. The basic standard for ESD is 61000-4-2. And the test result is typically either a pass or a fail, where the results can be very consistent and there is definitely no black magic here. There are different degrees of failure though. For absolute majority of consumer electronic equipment, a pass means that the application of electrostatic discharge has not caused the device to lose connection or stop its main function. However, some visible signs of disturbance such as flickering LEDs are acceptable. Unless it's a medical device or something that comes from a highly regulated industry, in which case the test voltage will be much higher and those things are definitely not acceptable at all. By the way, the test voltage for consumer electronics is typically 4 kV and 8 kV and uh, this may sound like a lot to you, but this is what actually happens when a human touches another human and passes electrostatic discharge. We can develop this kind of potential, but because it's such a tiny current and it's really short in duration, it feels like a light tickle. After you've finished with ESD testing, I do not recommend you to sell this unit to a customer, because even though the unit may appear like it's fine, it has probably sustained some damage from the testing, which is quite vigorous and really not electronics friendly at all. As part of ESD testing procedures, there are other 61000 tests and standards which cover surge immunity and harmonics. For the surge test, a surge generator like this one is used to create 5 positive and 5 negative surges on the power supply at 1 kV. And the fast transient or burst test is using the same device, testing at 1 kV for AC and half a kV for DC. Another test is specified by EN61 
000-4-6 standard, which uses AM FM signal generator to create a disturbance near the device at 3 volts RMS for 0 to 10 MHz and at 1 volt RMS for 10 to 80 MHz. The objective of all of those tests, as before, is no observable change to the normal operation of the unit. Another two standards that are worth talking about are the EN61000-3-2, which specifies limits for harmonic distortion on the 50 Hz main supply, and the EN61000-3-3, which deals with voltage fluctuations and flicker on equipment to under 16 amps. However, they do not apply to equipment rated less than 75 watts. The measurement of harmonic frequencies of under 2 kHz is taken, which is the 40th harmonic of 50 Hz, and the limits are 0.9% at 3rd harmonic, 0.4% at 5th, 0.3% at 7th, 0.2% at 9th, and 0.1% at all the others. The general idea is to conduct the tests in the mode expected to produce the maximum total harmonic current under normal operating conditions. Typical test equipment uses a low output impedance power amplifier driven by a 50 Hz sine wave oscillator and a measuring instrument that takes a snapshot of harmonic line current waveform to compare it against limits. In general, the equipment that passes the conducted emissions tends to pass those tests as well. So here it is, the brief introduction to the magic world of EMC, and in the next video I will cover the RF immunity test. By the way, can you name those two circuits that I've drawn on my whiteboard? And if you can, what are the applications for them? As a bonus tip for those of you who would like to dig into some of the standards mentioned here themselves, I gonna say that BSI offers a fantastic service for students where you can uh, log in into BSOL website and download any of those standards absolutely for free or any of the EN standards in fact, which is a fantastic service and I highly recommend you to explore it. Have a look at the link in the description and see for yourselves. So that's it, like and subscribe and I'll see you in the next video.